Hello everyone. Um, welcome to this very special anniversary screening of Kiki's Delivery Service. Um, quick show of hands, who's seen this before? Okay, most of you kind of thought that. Um, leave your hand up if this is one of your favorite films of all time. Okay, half. Okay. Anyone seen this back when it came out in 1989? No, that would have been a lot of bonus points, but no, me neither. I was five. And, yeah, okay. Anyway, um, I'm Adam Dubain, and whenever there's a Studio Ghibli film here, they basically throw up a big Totoro signal in the sky, and I come running, so that's why I'm here. Um, I have a background in film theory and film translation, and for more than eight years now, I've researched storytelling in Japanese animation. And today I'm here to give a quick introduction to why this film is important and some elements for you to notice as you're watching. Um, there will also be a QA and a and a discussion afterwards, so if you'd like to stick around and discuss the film, feel free to join me in the bar upstairs after the screening. Um, there's also a complimentary guide for the Studio Ghibli films that I created for these screenings, so you can get that on my website, followthemoonrabbit.com. Okay, so this film is 30 years old this year, and it's really interesting uh, to watch, especially after all these Disney trailers that we just saw. Um, not only the Kiki, the film, not age, but it was so ahead of its time. The Western films, and especially films for children, are still barely catching up with the things that Kiki was already saying in 1989. Um, because when you look at it, Kiki is about trusting children, and especially young girls, with independence and making their own decisions as they're growing up. And you're not only allowed, but encouraged to go out into the world and explore and find the thing that best fits your abilities. And despite all the locales in this film being this mix between French and Italian and German and Swedish architecture, this is a Japanese story at its core. So it sets out to find the balance between you as an individual finding your calling and then putting that calling into the service of your community. Um, so, why is this story important to writer, director Hayao Miyazaki? Here he is, 48 years young, in 1989. Um, and he always likes to look at the problems that his audience is facing, and then look at the stories that are currently told to that audience. And in this case, this is the Japanese storytelling genre called The Magical Girl, or Maho Shoujo. Um, now, Kiki, with her flying broom and talking cat, comes from a long line of Japanese witches, borrowing from Western concepts and visuals of witches, without the baggage of Western history, Japanese artists have used these characters to tell new stories about female empowerment for more than 50 years now. And one of the earliest people to do that was Japanese comic artist Fujio Akatsuka and his probably magical cat, at least this 50% magical. Um, and he's the author of what's considered to be the first magical girl manga, Himitsu no Akachan, The Secrets of Akachan, first published in 1962. And the secret is that she gets a magic mirror with which she can transform into anything she wants to. And, and this then is Osamu Tezuka, who's an amazingly prolific manga artist and one of the founders of modern Japanese animation. And he's responsible for not only the first prototype of the magical girl, Princess Knight, in the 50s, but his was the first animated magical girl series, Maho Tsukai Sari, or Sally the Witch, in 1966 in glorious black and white. Um, Sari provided much of the groundwork for the magical girl. She's 10 years old with an exotic Western style skirt and haircut, new to Japan at that time, and she uses her magical powers in secret to help out with everyday things like conjuring ice cream for her friends or summoning a fancy house to play in or catching the occasional burglar. Um, and despite Sari's focus on this everyday sort of magic, the series does coincide with second wave feminism in Japan and shows some of the new ideals of independence and opportunity that Japanese girls can now aspire to, very different from previous tradition. So then comes the next generation of artists and animators, Miyazaki included, and he builds and extends on these foundations in his early standout film, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Anyone seen that? It is, it is good, a lot of people. It is a must watch uh, if you haven't seen it yet. In that film, he asks, what if this magical girl character did more than help out in mischief and things around the house? What if she was also the hero that goes on and saves the world? And Nausicaa was a huge revelation in Japan when it came out and created its own genre of world-saving superhero girls that would dominate the 90s and beyond. So why do so many Japanese artists create stories centered around young and magical women? Well, 
many of them, especially Tezuka and Miyazaki and later people like Noko Takeuchi who created the hugely popular Sailor Moon franchise in the bottom right corner there, they're all trying to figure out an answer to how do we do things differently as a society. Coming out of World War II, there is a period of soul searching in Japan. What can we do so we never again end up with a culture based on an oppressive hierarchy, on violence? How do we encourage a culture that is built on peace instead? And one answer to that is, instead of focusing exclusively on the adventures of boys and men who go out and get ahead through fighting, new stories have to be introduced where young modern girls solve problems in non-violent ways. So when Miyazaki goes to adapt the children's book, Kiki's Delivery Service, he goes back to the roots of the modern Japanese witch and looks at how this character can function as part of a peacetime society which is why there are no enemies in this film at all. Kiki's quest is not to defeat some evil being or solve a big problem that she herself has created, which is a lot of what Western animation does with its female heroes. Kiki's quest instead is to figure out her own place in life as someone who has just left childhood behind and she's in this in-between period between childhood and adulthood. She has to figure out what she wants to do with her talents that she can also help her community with. And here's the twist that Miyazaki introduces there. In a lot of the early magical girl stories, the magic is all about wish fulfillment. You can conjure up fun things to wear and pretend to be an adult with, but at the end of the episode, you turn back into a child. You don't really grow. But in Kiki's world, magic is a talent just like any other, and you have to figure out how to make it work if you want to be able to make money and take care of yourself as an adult. And the film is quite realistic about how in today's world you have to make money to survive. And there are many scenes focusing on the struggles of living on a tight budget, which is not really like a magical adventure film. Having only one set of clothing will be a constant source of stress for Kiki throughout the film, if you watch. And if you pay attention at the really short scene at the end of the film, when Kiki goes back to the shop window that she was looking at earlier, you will see what this film wants to tell you about the values that it finds important. So Miyazaki doesn't sugarcoat growing up. It is hard to move away from home and try to figure out how to operate in a new society that's completely different from where it came from. And that's okay because you can also figure it out. This incidentally is why the film hits home with a lot of expats all around the world. It perfectly captures this phase of, I'm not there anymore, but I'm not really here yet either. Thankfully, this is one of those ideal worlds, those small-scale utopias where no one questions a young woman's right to work or to create or to run her own business. She even gets a lot of mentorship along the way from the people who've done it before her, the artist, the baker and her husband, the old lady. They all bring advice and even investment, literally, because Kiki is also about entrepreneurship and figuring out how to make it as an artist or a self-employed person. There are actual scenes about figuring out where there's a gap in the market, how to get your first customer, what rates you should charge for your service, dealing with writer's block, continuing work even when others are having fun or when the weather is just awful. And this is all hard work and the film doesn't shy away from showing you that. And even though Kiki's art, what she's best at is flying, that's not all just fun and games either. Miyazaki wrote this in his early notes for the film. It is usually felt that the power of flight would liberate one from the earth, but freedom is accompanied by anxiety and loneliness. So you can watch out for all the times when there's flying in the film and how the emotional context of the flying changes in each scene based on how Kiki's feeling at the moment. And finally, this film is about loss. Uh, Miyazaki said at one point that classic magical girl stories do not include loss at all, and that's wrong because every time you step into a new era in your life, you gain something, but you also have to leave something behind. Things are good again after you've gone through your transition, but they will also never be the same again. There's a bit of a melancholy there, and that's why the film ends as it ends, at least if you're watching the original Japanese version, because when Disney bought and dubbed this film into English for the first time, they were a bit naughty about it, and not only changed the cat's personality from timid and cautious to sarcastic, they actually went ahead and changed the ending, regardless of what the original artist intended the film to say. And the change shows a big difference between mainstream American storytelling and Japanese storytelling. An American happy ending happens when I have something, then I lose it, and then I get it back. I will have more in the end than what I started out with, otherwise the adventure is considered a failure. And in Japanese storytelling, as you go through your life, you gain and learn new things, but 
you also let go of things along the way. It is happy and sad at the same time, which is, I think, more closer to what life actually is like. But I don't want to spoil the end of this film for, for those who haven't seen it yet. So the one thing I would say is that the difference between the original and the edited version is the talking cat says something at the end of the film that he does not say in the original Japanese. Um, and there are actually multiple versions of the dub, and they fixed it in a later version, so even I don't know which version is going to screen now. In any case, if you have the original at home, it's a good idea to pop in the disc and watch the last two minutes again in the subtitle version, or you can just come up to me after the film and ask me, I'll, I'll just tell you. Okay, so there's, there's so much more to say about Kiki and the other Ghibli films, so if you'd like to learn more, you can hop onto my website, followthemoonrabbit.com, to download my guide to all the Ghibli films, and I will see you after the screening in the bar upstairs for questions and discussion. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the film. Hey, this is Adam from Follow the Moon Rabbit. If you like this talk, you'll be happy to know that there's more. Do know that not all of my stuff is video. I've got free ebooks and blog posts and a podcast is on the way. So to make sure you don't miss any of that, hop on over to followthemoonrabbit.com and join the Moon Rabbit Collective. It's completely free and you'll get my Studio Ghibli Secrets Guide as a welcome gift. So go on to followthemoonrabbit.com and sign up. See you there.